today's demo from my side will be really fast because I just want to announce that we have a first draft of the hierarchical consensus spec. Um, as you may know from previous demo days, uh, we finished with a first MVP of the protocol. We kind of know now what are the details and, and the basic end-to-end -end implementation of the protocol. And we are working on uh, having an alternative implementation in Rust, leveraging the, um, the forest client. So we are exploring that line of work because right now everything is, so HC is implemented in a fork of Lotus in Eudico, and we are exploring having an alternative implementation. And that's why we started this line of work of having a first draft spec. So if you go here, you'll see uh, the description of the architecture, how all of the sub protocols work, like the checkpointing protocol, how cross net transactions are propagated, and all of the low level models, as well as some future work, like for instance, the detectable misbehavior or how collateral and slashing work. The idea is to have soon a draft of a FIP that we can start discussing with the community. But in the meantime, if anyone wants to read the spec, start using the MVP implementation, or even like give us feedback, if you see something that it, it doesn't make sense at all, feel free to open a PR here in the protocol consensus lab. I can, I don't know if to share it here in Zoom or maybe in Slack. But uh, yeah, so feel free to, to give us feedback. Right now, this just suffered a first internal review by the members of, of Consensus Lab, but we are starting to spread this so that any, anyone can give us feedback. And I guess that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so this is uh, the IPFS operator. <laughs> uh, the IPFS operator is a Kubernetes operator uh, that allows you to quickly and easily uh, start up IPFS cluster. Uh, we I don't know, uh, there's probably times, there's probably a, a, a lot of Kubernetes operator, Kubernetes people out there who uh, would like to use web th more Web3 stack. And we, uh, up to this point, don't support it very well. Uh, so hopefully this is a step toward uh, increasing that support. Uh, I want to start off uh, by just showing you how it's used. There we go. Uh, I just want to show you how to create uh, create a cluster. I'm going to go back to this, but I'll show you, I'll, uh, I want to have a really good, uh, you know, I'll circle back to this and you'll, you'll see what happened. But uh, this is the cluster creation process, kubectl apply dash F, uh, and we just apply, give it a file. And boom. Has creating an IPFS cluster ever been easier than this? It's uh, basically, uh, you're done. Actually, the operator is still working in the background, but um, I want to I show you what's going on inside here. This is it. Basically, we, we took out all the critical components, uh, the critical decisions that you might want to make, uh, namely the storage and how many replicas you want to have. In this case, uh, we're just, you know, each node is only going to have 50 gigs, pretty small. Um, and uh, we're going to set up 100 replicants. So uh, we'll check back on this later. And uh, I just want to get that started for now. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this, this is the page that basically shows that. Uh, and it, looking at the, the collab cluster is indeed a breeze. Um, so what, what this is doing, um, we are uh, going to, we're going to create a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of pods. Uh, they're going to, uh, uh, oh yeah, collab collab clusters. Um, are you guys from, if you guys are familiar with there's a, a IPFS cluster has a feature called collabs collab dot cluster IPFS cluster dot io. Uh, these are this is a feature of IPFS cluster that allows you to follow uh, the pins that are going on in another cluster. Uh, setting up collab clusters is also very easy. Um, we can create uh, an IPFS cluster simply by uh, specifying what who you want to follow. Uh, this will just it's the same process as creating a regular cluster just as you just as you saw, but in addition to allowing you to use it for your own purposes, it will also pin uh, you know important content from around the world uh, that were this in this example we'd be pinning the Filecoin uh, proof params, we'd be pinning uh, the IPFS websites, the Gutenberg uh, content, Pac-Man uh, packages, uh, quick, quick, easy. Um, 
Yeah, uh, let's see. Yeah, scaling a cluster. Uh, get IPFS. These are, I have two clusters now, uh, one that I created earlier and one that I created just a couple of minutes ago. Uh, let's see, how do we uh, scale a cluster? Uh, so all Kubernetes objects are typically displayed in YAML. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, this looks kind of similar to the one to the setup that we just saw. Um, I want to change my, let's say replicas. Uh, I don't want four nodes. That's too small. Uh, let's, let's go, uh, let's go six and just save that done. No provisioning hardware, no, uh, messing around with, uh, cloud providers, no, uh, cabling, no uh, configuration, just edit the config file, finished. Um, just to prove that this works, get, get pods. There we go. Uh, we've got our uh, cluster with 100 nodes still being built. Uh, and now we have our six nodes. Uh, looks like the last one's just finishing up right now, but uh, the, you know, we're, we're up to six nodes for that collab cluster already. Nice, quick. Uh, yeah, okay. So now let's back up a little bit. <laughs> what is an IPFS operator? Uh, I wanted to start off with that so that we can give a little bit of time for the, the 100 node cluster to build while we go on with the rest. Um, what is an IPFS operator? Uh, Ku Ku or, excuse me, a Kubernetes operator. Uh, Kubernetes uh, allows you to extend the API by adding custom resources. Uh, and basically, when you, whenever you do this, you have an operator. Uh, in this case, we have this uh, object called an I, called an IPFS uh, cluster. Yeah, we have this object. This is kind IPFS. That's a, that's called a CRD, uh, custom resource definition. Uh, you pass it parameters, and you can have some custom road uh, code running uh, that will uh, act on those parameters and create things. Uh, I put some examples here. Uh, these are some great uh, Kubernetes operators that exist. The, the uh, Postgres operator, if you change the size of it, it knows how to handle, uh, you know, wall backups. <laughs> uh, you don't need to be a DBA to run Postgres if you use the operator. Uh, Prometheus, same way. Uh, if you deal with Prometheus monitoring, uh, you can edit uh, Prometheus targets on the fly without like going in and editing any of the config files. Uh, and of course, this one, this one that we're uh, discussing right now. Um, it all the minutia to do to do with uh, setting up an IPFS cluster. Uh, you just you probably noticed that I didn't do any of it, right? Um, a little bit more uh, deeper into the weeds, uh, what uh, how this actually works uh, is basically it's an IPFS node uh, with IPFS cluster installed next to it. This is the standard IPFS cluster that you uh, know and love. Uh, additionally, the follow the way the follower ship works, uh, there's one additional pod for every cluster that you're following. Uh, so if you're following, you know, 10 uh, different clusters, you know, uh, good work. Uh, there'll be 10, uh, you know, additional pods that, that are all here. Uh, basically, they're connecting to, to this IPFS node and uh, making requests to the IPFS to store content. Uh, the way this looks at at a whole cluster. And this is actually the reason why an op uh, operator is necessary, uh, is that to set up the entire cluster, it is, whoa, <laughs> it's very complicated. Uh, but uh, you can see here, we have uh, a number of IPFS nodes. Uh, you know, They're sitting here behind a load balancer that enables you to interact with the nodes. Uh, internally, these IPFS clusters are doing a lot of complicated stuff. They all have peer IDs. They have a consensus protocol, which might be RAFT or CRDT. Uh, they're talking to each other, uh, doing membership joins and all this. Uh, your application, that's this yellow box sitting over here. Uh, this is the experience that you want. You want to be able to just say, I want you to add this file. Something happens. Uh, and then uh, over here on the left, that's you. Uh, I can just say, I want to read this file uh, over IPFS and it should just work like magic. Um, yeah, so <laughs> uh, I want to show an example of this. Uh, let's do that. Uh, ta -ta. Okay, uh, I have my handy dandy notes right here. So let me just copy that. Uh, hello from Kate's. Let's go ahead and use IPFS cluster add. 
to add that to the cluster, uh, not with a capital letter, but uh, lowercase. There we go. Uh, so this adds it to the cluster. Uh, this is indeed adding it to the cluster uh, that is running uh, in I, in Kubernetes. I set up a port forward. Um, but what you can see is that we get a ID back and we can fetch this over uh, IPFS or even through the gateway. Uh, yeah, there we go. It's it's visible over IPFS. Uh, and indeed, you can do this with any of them. Uh, Echo, random, uh, let's put this uh, IPFS cluster. Add more files. We get a different CID. Um, let's uh, let's see what we got. IPFS, uh, DHT, uh, find provs. Let's find this file that we just created. Uh, this is this is going to be uh, demo uh, hell. Uh, let me let me let me use the other one just uh, so just in case there's a problem. But... Okay, <laughs> uh, so the, the file that we added a little bit earlier, uh, we've got to give it some time to propagate, but uh, the file that we added a little bit earlier, these are uh, IPFS nodes that are running in our cluster. Um, and indeed, if we, uh, if we were to exec into one of these, uh, there we go, IPFS ID, what's my ID? Uh, this is this uh, F3. It looks like that's this that's this one right here. Uh, so we are indeed storing these files on the cluster that we created uh, and fetching them. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, this is the 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 observation that I want to that I want to really like hit home here is that uh, you can add files and retrieve it off of IPFS. Uh, doing that is easy. All the complicated parts, generating the the peer IDs, generating the uh, cluster secret. Uh, I bet you didn't even know that you had to do that just from looking at this. Um, yeah, wow, complicated. <laughs> uh, and, and yes, uh, this is the overall point uh, for uh, putting this out here. We want to uh, use things like this, use operators to lower the barrier to entry. Um, there are probably people out here who uh, use Kubernetes in their day-to-day -day life for their business, and they, you know, maybe read about Web3 Stack and they want to try it, and then they're like, "Oh, this isn't for me." But uh, if there is an operator out there that is easy to pick up, uh, maybe there, maybe that, uh, you know, puts them in a position where they're actually able to try it. Um, yeah. Uh, Compatibility layer level. Uh, this is a this is a uh, uh, sort of a, a matrix to show like where uh, different types of operators are. Uh, I would honestly say we're still we're still in the very developing phase of this, so uh, we're probably somewhere between level one and level two. Um, we can do the basic install, and we can handle some uh, some like light changes like you can see that i can uh increase the scale of it and i can uh do some on the some on the fly changes uh as some of these you know deep insights and stuff like that uh are to be uh or to come later i guess uh still working on it still work in progress uh yeah i'd put us right around level one level two something like that um and uh to top this off uh, where can you find it? Uh, this is being developed in uh, with in conjunction with uh, Red Hat Emerging Technologies. So uh, its current home is right there, uh, Red Hat ET IPFS operator. Uh, once we get this into more uh, of a production state, uh, it will be on Operator Hub. Uh, Red Hat is uh, planning on uh, making sure that this is available on uh, uh, OpenShift, uh, and of course, uh, we will include it in, uh, you know, and make it as uh, widely available as possible as it grows in maturity. Uh, and I think that is it for me. Uh, hopefully, oh, one, one sec. <laughs> I nearly forgot. 
Uh, I wanted to see, uh, yeah, how many how many nodes that we could create. Uh, I'm trying. I'm going for a hundred. Uh, looks like we created. Uh, looks like 41 is the highest ones. I did do a little bit of time, uh, you know, some timing on this before. Uh, it takes right around, I wouldn't say like uh, 20, 25 minutes to create a full 100 node IPFS cluster. Uh, but dare I say that is much faster than uh, creating it manually. So. Uh, there we go. <laughs> uh, I think that's it for me. Thank you. Yeah, great. So um, today I want to give an update on the DHT routing table health study that we've been conducting at ProLab. And so I'm going to start uh, quickly uh, by introducing, because uh, uh, this is a bit technical, so the Kademlia DHT routing table, the way it works. So. Um, Kademlia is a distributed hash table, um, which is basically a decentralized overlay network in which there is no central peer. And each node has to know at least some of the other peers participating in the network um, just to be connected. And this set of peers is called the routing table. And um, so in the Kademlia implementation, um, all of the peers that are in this routing table are sorted uh, per, so are sorted in what's called K buckets, uh, which um, is uh, defined by the XOR distance between a peer ID and another peer ID. Uh, each bucket is kept at 20 peers. So I'm going to just give a quick example to uh, illustrate better. So for instance, if we take um, a random peer uh, identified by an 8-bit uh, string, so 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Um, And uh, I just generated some random other 8-bit strings. And uh, I filled in uh, those peers or those bit string in the uh, K bucket of the initial peer. And as we can see, so uh, the, the logic is uh, the if a two bit string share a prefix, of length x, it's going to be in the bucket x. So for instance, in the bucket 0, all of the peers start with a 1, uh, whereas the, the our reference peers start with a 0, and, for, yeah, and so on. So for instance, in bucket 2, the all of the peers share a, two, uh, a common prefix of length 2. And we can see that when the peers are generated randomly, which is the case for um, IPFS or LIP2P identifiers. And we expect to have a lot of peers in the low ID bucket and uh, way fewer in the higher ID bucket and in an exponential way. So to measure a bit the health of the, um, the actual network, um, we use the Nebula crawler, which will um, try to we'll, that will crawl the network and uh, provide a snapshot with all of the peers that are online and all the, the state of the routing table. So all of the peers that are in each node's uh, routing table. And so for this specific study, uh, the data was taken out of 28 crawls, so from 28 snapshots of the network over one week. And so the methodology uh, we use to uh, yeah, for, for, for this study. Um, so given the global snapshot, we were able to reproduce the K bucket for each of the peers um, simply by computing the XOR distance between each of the peer in the routing table and the reference peer. And from the global view, uh, let's say we are able to see if some of the node should be included in a K bucket, but are actually missing from the the K bucket we retrieve from the network row. So we can see what the theoretical bucket should be and what they actually are. And also for this study, it was a bit hard to um, compute all of the XOR distances because uh, to see if any of the peers were missing, we need to get the X closest peers to a specific peer ID, which is uh, computationally expensive as the XOR distance is not linear. And so we implemented a, a binary try in Python uh, to speed things up. So the result we get 
from, from this study is the first we want to study what's the ratio of peers that are in someone's routing table but are unreachable from the network. And so, so basically stale entries in the in the in the routing table. So that's the result we get. So for bucket zero to eight, the rate is quite low. So the buckets zero to bucket eight are the buckets that are full, that contain 20 peers almost all of the time. And so the rate is very low. It's um, on average out of the 20 peers uh, that are in the bucket, 0 0.75 are unreachable. So that's very good given the, the high churn rate that we observe in IPFS. And for the bucket 9 to 21, we observe a higher rate, but it's still very acceptable. And so I think we obtain different results for the low ID bucket and the higher ID bucket because uh, the replacement method um, is different, is implemented differently in Google. Um, now to the next um, measurement. So now we want to see if the distribution is um, the distribution of the peers in the K buckets is as we expected. So as the peer, the peer ID are expected to be generated randomly over um, the key space of 256 bit, we expect that um, buckets uh, so yeah, there will be a halving on the candidates that are eligible for each of the buckets. And so we can see that bucket zero to eight are capped at the maximum of 20. And then we can see this exponential growth or decline going down. And so that's exactly the, the number we expected, uh, which is good. And uh, so when we look at the, the rate or the number of missing peers, for each bucket, we can see that for the full buckets, the so yeah, so, sorry again, uh, the missing peers are if um, first bucket is not full, and second there is a peer in the network that would have fit this bucket, but that is actually not in this bucket that we've been able to observe using the global snapshot. Then uh, the missing peers rate uh, for the full bucket. Uh, is very low. It's 0 0.12 uh, out of the 20 peers, and it's a bit higher for the higher ID bucket. But again, it is still very, very acceptable. And now getting to uh, the so one of the key um, properties of the Academia DHT is that the node is supposed to be aware or to have the 20 closest peers. Um, to itself in its routing table, uh, just for uh, routing uh, yeah, property. And what we observe is that uh, given the high churn rate, again, so we expect to have, uh, yeah, not 100%, obviously, because some nodes are entering and leaving the network, so it changes constantly. Uh, we observe, uh, surprisingly, that 61% of the peers know all of their 20 closest peers. So all of the 20 closest peers are in the K buckets. And 95% uh, of the peers know at least 18 out of the 20 um, closest peers, which is um, also excellent. So what we can tell uh, from this study is that the, the DHT is very healthy. Um, maybe more than we, we could have expected. So it's perfect. So we have a very low rate of stale entries in the, in the K buckets. The peer distribution is as expected. Um, only a few peers are missing from the routing table, which is good again. And a very high rate of no, no uh, 18 out of the 20 closest peers. So that's very good. Um, so the pro lab is doing a lot of RFM, I think at the moment there are 20 RFM that we publish on the GitHub uh, repo protocol uh, slash network measurement. So you can, I encourage you to go and check them out. Uh, we already published one, which is RFM2, and this one, RFM19, so there is a report with much more details that is available um, 
on the so the PR is on mayor yet, but the report is already accessible. And uh, so I'm going to give some more details um, on this at the IPFS thing um, next week. So if you're around, uh, make sure to attend the measuring IPFS track. Um, and we also measure some, some things that were odd and may mean that the THC isn't uh, as healthy on, the, on some other aspect as we think because uh, the diversity in the low ID bucket um, is lowering over time. And so it might become a problem because the network may become centralized. And here are some references with some links, so I'll, I'll upload them later uh, on the Google Docs. And yeah, that's it for me.